Well, in this talk, I want to discuss the idea of portal veins. But before I do that, I want to define a couple of simple terms. And the first term I want to define is an artery. Now, an artery, or any arterial vessel, is any vessel carrying blood away from the heart. It's that simple. So, for example, the aorta and major systemic arteries are going to carry blood from the left ventricle, ultimately to all cells of the body. What they're actually doing is carrying blood from the left ventricle to the systemic capillaries. So I guess you could say that an artery is a vessel carrying blood from the heart to capillaries. It's carrying blood away from the heart. And it's similar on the right side of the heart. The right ventricle pumps blood into the pulmonary artery and this carries blood to the pulmonary capillaries in order to be oxygenated. So some people get a bit confused already there. They say, well, arteries carry oxygenated blood. Well, yeah, that's true, but only in the systemic circulation. It's not true in the pulmonary circulation. In the pulmonary circulation, the blood leaving the right ventricle is going to be partially deoxygenated and will be pumped through the pulmonary artery to the lungs for the express purpose of being oxygenated. That's why it's been pumped to the lungs, so it can get oxygenated. Now normally, the veins that carry blood, well always I guess, the veins that carry blood back from the, from the body, the systemic veins, are going to carry deoxygenated blood. But the veins which carry blood from the lungs back to the left side of the heart are going to carry oxygenated blood. The blood's going to be rich in oxyhemoglobin. So veins and arteries aren't defined by the type of blood they carry. They're defined by the direction in which they carry that blood. So a vein, a vein is going to be defined as any vessel which carries blood from capillaries back towards the heart. So in the systemic circulation, typically the blood is going to go from arteries to arterioles to capillaries. In the capillaries, it's going to give up oxygen. It's going to pick up waste carbon dioxide. It's going to deliver nutrients. It's going to pick up nitrogenous waste products. Then that's going to be drained in the venous system. But the veins are defined because they're carrying the blood from the capillaries back to the heart. It's a directional thing. So the pulmonary veins are going to carry blood from the lungs back to the heart. The systemic veins are going to carry blood from the body tissues back to the heart. So what about this idea we first started thinking about portal veins? Well, I actually only know of two portal veins in the body. Um, I can only think of two groups. Uh, one is the hepatic portal vein, taking blood to the liver, and the other is in the pituitary. But first of all, let's think about the um, let's think about the hepatic portal vein first. Now, in the gut, in the gastrointestinal tract, there's a huge amount of bacteria. It's been estimated that about a third of the dry weight of faeces is actually bacteria. So it wouldn't be much of a fun experiment to try, but if you did try it, you could get some faeces, dry it out, and uh, about a third of the weight of that faeces would, uh, would be bacteria. So the gastrointestinal tract is carrying huge amounts of bacteria and of course many of these are symbiotic they're actually good for us we need a normal gut flora you know if you take antibiotics and kill all your flora off you can get irritable bowel syndrome and diarrhea and thrush and all sorts of problems the bacterial flora are good in the large intestine the bacterial flora also produce vitamin k i think it's vitamin k yeah i'm sure it is they produce vitamin k so it's good bacterial flora is good but Bacteria 
release a lot of toxins. So bacteria are living cells, they metabolize the same way that you and I do, but they produce a lot of toxins. And many of the toxins are absorbed into the mucosa and submucosa of the gut. Now in the submucosa of the gut there are many capillaries that drain the blood from the wall of the gastrointestinal tract. But can you see that the blood that's draining into the venous system from all these capillaries is going to have a high level of toxin in it. There's going to be a lot of bacterial toxins. And if these bacterial toxins are allowed just to circulate around the body freely, then we'd feel sick all the time. Because that's why you feel sick when you've got a bacterial infection, because there's bacterial toxins floating around in your blood, and that makes you feel sick. So what we need is some way of filtering these bacterial toxins out of the blood that's being drained from the gut before this blood gets back into the systemic circulation. We need to be able to filter out these toxins. Unfortunately, in the body, we are equipped with a filter for toxins, and that's called the liver. The liver contains many enzymes which will degrade bacterial toxins. So it makes perfect sense that all the blood that's drained from the gastrointestinal tract, and when we say all the gastrointestinal tract, we do pretty well mean all of it, um, the lower third of the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestine, most of the large intestine. All of that blood, all of those venous systems, all of those veins drain into one large vein. And that large vein takes the blood into the liver. And when it gets to the liver, that vein divides out and takes blood into the millions of liver sinusoids. R really, these are the liver capillaries. So if you like, the hepatic portal vein begins in the capillaries of the gastrointestinal tract and ends in the capillaries of the liver. And I'm calling it a vein because it's taking blood back from the capillaries in the gastrointestinal tract back towards the heart. OK, it's going back via the liver, but, you know, the direction is still going back towards the heart, so it's defined as a vein. Now, as that blood goes into the liver sinusoids, it comes into intimate contact with untold millions, billions, I guess, of hepatocytes, the liver cells. And as the blood goes through the liver sinusoids, coming into contact with the hepatocytes, with the liver cells, the liver cells break down the bacterial toxins into harmless metabolites. Then, when the blood is drained through the liver, it arrives in the hepatic portal vein, it goes through the liver, then it can be drained back into the systemic venous circulation in hepatic veins and the hepatic drain veins drain back into the inferior vena cava. The inferior vena cava is going to take the blood back to the right side of the heart where it rejoins the systemic circulation. So it's vital that the liver filters the blood before it gets back into the venous circulation otherwise we'd all feel sick all of the time and no one will get any work done. It will be a hopeless situation. So it's vital that the blood goes to the liver first and all that blood is taken from the gut directly to the liver in the hepatic portal vein so it can be detoxified. Also, also all of the nutrients in the body are going to be derived from food and they're all going to be absorbed through the gastrointestinal tr tract as well. So all the nutrients that we can ever get are going to be absorbed via the gastrointestinal tract. And it is the liver which metabolizes and processes these nutrients. So it also makes sense that all the nutrients that are absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract go directly to the liver where they can be metabolized and processed. Uh, for, for example, um, amino acids might be absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract. And you might remember that amino acids can be essential or non-essential. That's because the liver can transaminase amino acids. It can convert some amino acids into other amino acids. 
it can't make the essential amino acid because they must be in the diet but it can change one amino acid into another or um, the monosaccharides which are absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract can be glucose, fructose or galactose three monosaccharide simple sugars but the only sugar that the body likes to have in the blood of course is glucose when you're talking about blood sugar levels you're actually always talking about blood glucose levels so fructose and galactose might be absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract we don't particularly want that going into the systemic circulation so all the blood goes to the liver first as the blood goes through the liver virtually all of it the first time the blood goes through the liver those other monosaccharides will be converted into glucose so the only sugar we would expect to find in the systemic circulation is glucose so you can see that because all the blood goes to the liver first in the hepatic portal vein this kind of means that the liver is the is the gatekeeper of the systemic circulation it's not letting nasty things in it's only letting the good guys through to the systemic circulation because once it's in the systemic circulation the blood goes to precious places like your brain your myocardium your, your kidneys you know it, it's uh, it's it's a highly controlled environment in there and we don't want the wrong sorts of foods and we don't want toxins getting in there so the liver does that so the hepatic portal vein is taking all that blood directly to the liver it's going through the liver capillaries once it's been through the liver capillaries it's going to drain again into a hepatic vein and the hepatic vein is taking blood from the liver back to back to the systemic circulation so if you have got one of my physiology notes books the, the white book if you look on page 199 you'll see the diagram there with the gut the blood's been absorbed from the length of the gut to the liver then the blood's going through the liver back to the systemic circulation and actually the liver's got two blood supplies because the liver's very metabolically active so it's going to need some oxygen rich blood as well so blood is going to be supplied to the liver via the hepatic artery which branches directly from the, um, the aorta or fairly directly from the aorta so the liver's got two blood supplies really it's got um, the arterial blood supply carrying oxygen rich blood from the aorta and it's got the hepatic portal vein taking toxin toxin containing blood and nutrient rich blood from the gut to the liver for biochemical processing and there's another interesting um, um, application of this and that's called first pass metabolism first pass metabolism now if you take a drug orally that drug is going to be absorbed through the mucosa of the gastrointestinal tract if it's absorbed through the mucosa of the gastrointestinal tract that means that blood is all going to be taken to the liver in the hepatic portal vein and the proportion of the drug which is taken will be broken down in the liver because that's what the liver does it breaks down toxins and drugs a proportion of that drug will be broken down the first time the blood goes through the liver that means if you take 100 milligrams of drug in the gastrointestinal tract and 100 milligrams is absorbed assuming it's all absorbed then um, only a proportion of that will get through to the systemic circulation and, and it could be not that much of it 50% or more of the drug could be broken down the first time the drug goes through the liver I mean with some drugs it, it might be 90% of the drug is, is broken down the first time the drug goes through the liver because when it arrives in the liver from the hepatic portal vein the drug is at high concentrations it's kind of a target rich environment if, if you like and a lot of it can be broken down that means of the drug which is taken orally only a proportion of that gets through to the systemic circulation to have a potential uh, pharmacodynamic systemic effect that's called first pass metabolism it's the proportion of drug which is broken down the first time that drug goes through the liver and the first time the drug goes through the liver is when it is delivered to the liver 
via the hepatic portal vein. That's why with some drugs, the dose intravenously or intramuscularly, when the drug's given, given parenterally, is lower than the, um, the dose that you would give a drug orally because less is lost to first pass metabolism effects. But let's try and stick with this idea of portal veins and let's move on now to look at the, um, the portal system in the pituitary gland. Now when I started to learn about physiology I was taught that the pituitary gland is the leader of the endocrine orchestra and uh, there's a lot of truth in that but the pituitary gland has its own leader. But actually, just go back a bit. Let's think about the pituitary gland. Of course, it's in two lobes, isn't it, the pituitary gland? The anterior lobe, which is glandular tissue, the adenohypophysis, and the posterior lobe, which is neurological tissue, the neurohypophysis. Now, the neurohypophysis, the posterior gland, produces antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin. I think they're the only two hormones it produces. But in fact, those two hormones aren't produced by the pituitary gland. They're actually produced by the hypothalamus. And there's long neurosecretory neurons go from the hypothalamus down into the posterior pituitary, down into the neurohypophysis. And um, the antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin are actually released from the posterior pituitary um, because they're actually produced mostly in the, the uh, neuronal cell bodies in the hypothalamus and they go down the axons of these neurosecretory neurons to be released from the posterior lobe. But then the larger part of the pituitary gland is the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland. And the, um, the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland produces the so-called trophic hormones. These are the hormones that control the other endocrine glands. For example, the anterior lobe produces thyroid stimulating hormone to um, stimulate the thyroid gland to increase the production of thyroxine. It produces adrenocorticotrophic hormone to stimulate the adrenal cortical hormones. It produces a follicular stimulating hormone which develops the follicle during the first uh, 14 days of the menstrual cycle and causes the follicle to produce estrogen. And actually, interestingly, uh, follicular stimulating hormone in men stimulates spermatogenesis. It's the same hormone, it's just that it was discovered in, in females, so it was called follicular stimulating hormone. <laughs> I guess if it had been discovered in men, it would be called um, spermatogenesis stimulating hormone or, or some such name. Uh, the anterior lobe also produces luteinizing hormone that causes the um, follicle to release the, to release the ovum around about day 14 of a menstrual cycle and also luteinizes or yellows the follicular cells, turning them into the luteal cells of the corpus luteum, which carries on for the next um, 12, 13 days of the menstrual cycle producing a lot of progesterone to maintain the endometrium. And the anterior lobe also produces uh, prolactin and uh, growth hormone. So, so, so the anterior lobe is producing a range of these trophic hormones controlling the body and other, uh, other endocrine glands. But of course the $64,000 question is what controls the pituitary gland? You know, because glandular tissue really isn't that smart but the tissue in the body that is smart, the intelligent tissue, if you like, is the, it's the way I look at it anyway, is the neurological tissue. And the hypothalamus, of course, is full of neurons, the nerve cells. And what actually happens is the hypothalamus produces hormones or stimulating factors, which actually in turn stimulate the release of the trophic hormones from the pituitary gland. So hypothalamic neurohormones include, for example, um, growth hormone, releasing hormone. And that stimulates the pituitary, pituitary gland to produce growth hormone. 
the uh, hypothalamus produces a hormone called thyrotrophin releasing hormone and that stimulates the release of thyroid stimulating hormone from the um, from the anterior pituitary gland and there's a corticotrophin releasing hormone produced by the hypothalamus but that stimulates specific cells in the anterior pituitary gland to produce um, adrenocorticotrophic hormone so what we actually see is the the pituitary gland really isn't the leader of the endocrine orchestra it's just a, it's just a puppet president really um, the actual power behind the throne the, the smart part of the system is the hypothalamus so the, the hypothalamus is producing all these releasing hormones which precisely control the amount of hormones released from the anterior pituitary gland which okay in turn fair enough they do control the function of the rest of the endocrine system now an endocrine hormone is something which is released into the systemic blood supply that means it's going to be diluted with all of the blood in the body all the systemic blood now that's okay with an endocrine hormone because it produces enough to still stimulate the target tissues but when we're talking about the the hypothalamic stimulating hormones the hypothalamus only produces these hormones in very small amounts so rather than distribute these stimulating hormones produced by the hypothalamus rather than distribute them in the whole volume of the blood it makes sense to send them directly to the anterior pituitary gland where you want to use them where they're going to stimulate the anterior pituitary cells that would make much more sense then you'd only have to make little bits of the releasing factors and releasing hormones to stimulate the anterior pituitary trophic hormones and that's exactly what happens now if you've got a white physiology book um, turn to page 149 and there's a diagram of this in the, uh, the physiology notes book now what happens is that there's going to be an arterial blood supply taking blood into a network of capillaries in the hypothalamus so we know it's an artery because it's taking blood to capillaries then there's a primary capillary plexus there's a group of capillaries in the hypothalamus and these releasing hormones and releasing factors produced by the hypothalamus are going to diffuse into the blood going through the pituitary gland itself now these releasing hormones we want them to take their effect in the anterior pituitary so there's no point diluting them with all the systemic blood instead there's two portal veins which carry these the blood from the hypothalamus containing these releasing hormones directly to the anterior pituitary gland and once they get into the anterior pituitary gland they divide up again into capillaries meaning that the releasing factors and releasing hormones from the hypothalamus can come into contact with the cells in the anterior pituitary so again we see that a portal vein is a vein which starts in capillaries and ends in capillaries in this case it starts in the hypothalamus and ends in the anterior pituitary so it's portal because it starts in capillaries and ends in capillaries then of course the anterior pituitary gland is drained into a systemic vein so that the hormones released by the anterior pituitary can go into the systemic blood supply where they will stimulate and control the many glands that comprise the rest of the endocrine system um, the portal veins are still called veins in the case of the link between the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland because it's the artery that takes blood from the heart to the capillaries then when the blood goes from capillaries back to the heart the, those vessels are called veins and when it goes from the primary capillary plexus in the hypothalamus towards the anterior pituitary it's already started its journey back to the heart so we call them portal veins so that they go portal veins uh, are veins which start and end in capillaries they carry venous blood from one part of the body to another part of the body before going back into the systemic 
circulation.